Mm -hmm. oh, hello, thank you so much for being here for the International Day for Women and Girls in Science. Um, this is something that Deborah and I have been working on with the Gulf Coast Postdoc and Student Association. Um, we are starting a new group here on campus. We're calling it Women at GC Rec, and this is the first event of hopefully very many. Um, but expect to see more from us in the near future. And at the end, we'll be talking about our first meeting that will be this month. All right, so really, can you guys hear me? Uh, really, we're here today to celebrate women in science as well as highlight some of their accomplishments, including two um, women scientists here at the center, and then also to point out some of the unique challenges that women face in the STEM disciplines. And we picked today, like Audrey said, because it's the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. So it worked out really well, and we're so happy that people were able to come today, including those of you who are on Zoom. All right, so next is um, we're going to do some introductions about the event, uh, the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. And then we'll switch over to our guest presenters for the day. Then we'll have a panel discussion. So if you have questions, which I really hope you do, just jot them down and then save them for the panel discussion. Uh, and we'll have all of our questions and answers during that time. For those of you who are attending by Zoom, thank you so much. Um, go ahead and mute your microphone if you haven't already. And then if you would like to ask questions during the panel discussion, use the chat box within the Zoom app. And we'll be monitoring that during the whole um, presentation today. All right, and then finally, you'll see at the bottom of this slide some suggested um, hashtags as well as the Twitter handle for the women and International Women and Girls in Science Day. So feel free to use this if you plan on posting any pictures about this event on social media. Um, we recommend using these hashtags. Okay, um, and before we get started, just so you know about the purpose of this holiday, so it was established by the United Nations in 2015. And the purpose of it uh, is to recognize a critical role women and girls play in science and technology. And it's meant to promote full and equal access to participation in science for women and girls. So here at the center, we're actually honored to have very a whole lot of female um, scientists. We actually have about 50% um, of the population is women in science, which is pretty impressive. So we have three, three female professors, including Dr. Perez, um, Dr. Lahiri, and Dr. Lusk. And then we also have two female professors at the Plant City campus, um, Katie Lawson and Dr. Barry. Now, this wasn't always the case. We are kind of picking some people's brains, those of us who have been at the center for a while. And this is a pretty recent change. So Christine wanted us to note that um, we've always had a pretty strong female presence, within our a female presence within our student population, but really in the past few years, it's increased dramatically to the point where this past year, we had more female students than male students ever um, at our center. Um, she also wanted to note that Natalia Perez was the first female professor to come over in 2005 when we switched to our location here in Balm. Um, so we're definitely going to have a, a talk from her in the future. Um, she wasn't able to attend today because she's really busy with strawberries and all the awesome research she does. Um, so also we have about 75 women total. So give or take, because our numbers are kind of switching a lot with the grad students, but we have roughly 12 female grad students out of 36, and then four female postdocs out of 15 postdocs. And then the rest are um, OPS, science technicians, as well as a lot of interns from all over the world who are all female scientists. So I definitely want to recognize everybody um, who falls into these categories. Okay. There we go. <laughs> so sometimes the remote works and sometimes the computer works. Not really sure what's going on there. Um, okay, so 
Now I want to introduce our first guest speaker. So Dr. Lahiri is an assistant professor of entomology and nematology here at the center. She's one of the more recent additions to the Gulf Coast REC. Her research focuses on developing management strategies for insect and mite pests on small fruit crops, including strawberries, blueberries, and blackberries. And I'm very excited to learn more about her experiences coming to the G, um, GCREC, um, as well as her experiences as a female scientist. So welcome, Dr. Lahiri. All right. Right now the clicker is working. The clicker is working? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you all so much for being here. And thank you, Audrey and Deb, to, for putting all of this together. This is a very brave, very inspiring effort. And today's the day, and I was telling them that it almost feels like a perfect way to celebrate my one year work anniversary here at GCREC. So, uh, <laughs> thank you. Hopefully, this is working. Yep, it is. Okay, so. I'm going to start off by giving you a little bit of background about my journey as a woman in science, um, starting with my experiences in India, how I decided to become an entomologist in the first place, and then through that journey, uh, my interactions with my mentors, with my colleagues, friends, how I have grown as a scientist and as a person. So. To give you a little bit of background, now this, I am an entomologist at the end of the day. So by the end of this presentation, I wanna make sure that you learn something about insects <laughs> before you leave this room, if you don't know all of this already. Um, but I started my bachelor's program at the University of Delhi in India. And at that time, I knew that I wanted to do something in the field of biological sciences. I was a little confused because a lot of my friends in school said, oh, biotechnology is the way to go or microbiology is the way to go. That's, that, seems to be, that seems to be the, the uh, career of choice for most of my women colleagues. Uh, and the more ambitious women were, wanted to be doctors. I, at some point, wanted to be a veterinary uh, doctor as well. Um, and then I, uh, I knew I wanted to study basic biology. Uh, and so during my bachelor's education, which is a three-year program, by the way, in India, uh, bachelor of science degree. Uh, and in the final year, we had to take a, a, an applied, ent uh, applied entomology program. Now in that program, that changed my life actually, because uh, we were required to go to like the local bazaars, the farmer's market, if you will, and interact with the sellers and ask for vegetables. Hey, Bhaiya, if you have some infested vegetables, would you give, a, give it to us? Because we want to rear out insects, put together some life cycles, insect life cycles. And there was significant research credits for that. So we... Uh, me and my other colleagues, we spent a lot of time just roaming the bazaars, talking to growers, talking to our, uh, so I was a, a resident uh, in the college, it was a women's college. We had a kitchen garden of our own, so we would interact with our uh, uh, kitchen garden uh, uh, maintenance crew as well. So we got like many different pests uh, and we put together all these um, uh, insect life cycles, and it was a huge learning experience for me. But what I took most out of that experience was, this is applied research. A lot of people need this information. Um, and um, I, this, this, this may be it, this, is, this may be it. I think I see myself interacting with growers, interacting with people, just telling them what we are finding. I see value in this. So then after I completed my program, I went on to pursue a master's of science degree in environmental studies, again, at the University of Delhi. So I, I spent a lot of time in New Delhi, basically. So in this program, we had to work on a research dissertation uh, uh, project. For me, it was using gamma radiation to manage stored grain pests. Now in India, stored grain pests are a big issue. Uh, it almost sounds like production is not the problem, storage 
of the grains. That's the problem. And there's a lot of uh, beetles, for example. I worked on a weevil, uh, which particularly causes a lot of issues in storage of mung beans. Uh, and so I was looking at gamma radiation. And uh, as you know, gamma radiation, you can't just walk into a lab and produce and access gamma radiation. We were working with the defense department, traveling there with all the security uh, clearances, accessing the um, uh, the chamber and so that whole experience. It was just basically very exhilarating for a graduate student. Uh, and more importantly, we knew that we were working on a real issue. Uh, the country needed it. We, we needed to make sure that people are not starving because they couldn't access st uh, stored grains because the beetles ate them. And so during that coursework, we also had to study uh, environmental policies. And at that time, the environmental history, the history of the, all the environmental crises that's happening around the world. And we got introduced to Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. And that kind of hit, hit us. Me and a lot of my colleagues who have all gone on to become uh, serve the various aspects of environmental studies. Some of them work for na the national parks in India. Uh, some of them have become environmental policy makers in India. I have become an entomologist. Uh, but that kind of hit home that yes, indiscriminate application of pesticides can have a profound impact on generations. And so then I was like, yes, entomology, applied entomology, agricultural applied entomology. This is where I, I want to contribute. Uh, to in the world and make a difference. So then I did a master's of philosophy in zoology, which is kind of a degree that India still gives. It's kind of a stepping stone for a PhD program. It's an 18 month program. And I delved deeper into my project with gamma radiation to manage uh, beetles, stored grain uh, beetles. And then I joined the North Carolina uh, State University for a PhD program in 2010. And uh, there I was looking at the uh, stink bug management uh, and how to utilize native natural enemies um, and also an invasive insect species, kudzu bugs, uh, were a big issue at that time. So what can we understand? Uh, how can we understand its ecology, biology, overwintering behavior and monitor it better to come up with better uh, pest management solutions for that pest? And then I went, I completed my PhD program in 2014. And then I went on to do two postdoctoral projects. So when I get asked, well, how long does it typically take for uh, fresh graduates to land a assistant professor job? It took me four years, just so you know. <laughs> um, uh, but I decided to spend those four years being diversifying my CV working with as many diverse projects and as, very, uh, as, as many teams as I could, uh, and basically trying to fill the loopholes that I thought I had in my CV. So I wanted more grant writing experience. I wanted more uh, field experience with many different crops. Uh, and of course, I think uh, the best way to prepare for a faculty job interview or any interview is to start giving interviews. Your first interview may, may not be the most successful one, but you will learn so much from it. I think that's the best way to prepare for, for, for the job. Um, and so till 2019, I was a postdoc. And then February of 2019, I started here in the University of Florida. And here I am. Now, quickly, this is a, a multicolored Asian lady beetle. And I spent a lot of time counting beetle larvae and beetle adults when I was in Tifton, Georgia, uh, working on uh, uh, pest management, sugarcane aphid uh, pest management in sorghum. Uh, I just wanted to share this picture with you because I spent two years just counting them. <laughs> All right, just quick map where, where uh, my life started as a woman in science. So uh, northeastern part of India, that's, that's where uh, I spent most of my childhood and my uh, uh, school life and then in New Delhi next seven years and then 2010 I was here in USA working on my PhD program. So when I was asked to give this talk, A, I was very honored, B, 
the first thing I did was I googled what are the top women in STEM saying? What are their experiences? So two phrases jumped at me. Uh, this was an article. If you Google top 50 women in STEM, you will find this article, you will find this picture. Um, and you will find that it seems the take home message from their interviews is success is the best revenge. And also um, simply plow through whatever obstacles stand in your path. Uh, I don't know how much you would agree with these. We all have our different journeys, our different stories to tell. We all have unique challenges. Yes, success is the ultimate goal. I wouldn't quite term it, I, I couldn't, I wouldn't quite call it a revenge though. I think it's, uh, it's, it's more a proof to yourself of what potentials you have. Uh, and I think that is the biggest gift that you can give to yourself and to the next generation, women or men, doesn't matter. Uh, and then plowing through obstacles. Now, this is a big thing. And this, this, is, this, this is something as a woman or even men in science, obstacles are never going to go away. They're only going to get bigger as your responsibilities increase. So as Spider-Man said, you know, with great power comes great responsibilities. So th that's, that's definitely the reality. But the good news is with these obstacles, yes, you have to plow through it, but the key is to develop a good support system. Be confident with what you do and have faith in yourself. So again, I'm not, <laughs> I, I need to make sure that you learn something about entomology. When I talk about challenges, this currently is my professional challenge fruits that are damaged through thrips feeding and beautiful strawberry fruits that could have reached their potential, but they end up looking like that, bronzed, cracked. Well, so we also have in our professional life, we also have challenges that we are dealing with. Um, I think for women particularly, and I, I think this is not unique to women though, men suffer from these issues as well, but women more so, which is why we see the skew rep skewed representation of women. But I think historically, the underestimation of women is the biggest downfall, is, is the biggest obstacle. Um, I have been very fortunate because I come from a very progressive family and I am an, a single girl child. Uh, we went through a phase where India, even currently, is facing an issue of extreme female infanticide. Female babies, nobody wants women. They see, look at women as a burden. And then I, who was an only female child, the whole society thought it was their responsibility to tell my parents what they should or should not do. But my parents had the courage to stand up to everybody and said, no, it is her life. She needs to lead it the way she wants. And I think that is the greatest power right there. From I was never told that I can't achieve this or that, or this is beyond my powers. So I, I think that was the most inspiring thing for me. Um, talking, getting talking, talked down to. Um, that happens to me even now. And that's not going to probably go away. <clears throat> and then again, success is the best revenge in that case. And you just hope that at some point people stop talking down to you. Um, and then, as women, I think we feel, I don't know how much, how true it is, but we feel that we have very small room to make mistakes. Uh, even in India, I've, uh, a lot of my female colleagues, we used to be frustrated and we used to feel that, okay, we have to succeed in that one exam. Otherwise, the chance is gone. We will never get that chance back. On the other hand, our male colleagues would be feeling a little bit more calm, confident about, well, we, if we can't make it this time, maybe next time. But that next time sometimes doesn't come for women. And so I think that also is the biggest uh, kind of an issue. And I think women need to feel that it's okay to make mistakes. You need to learn from your mistakes and you need to move forward and don't feel that this is your last chance and don't give up if you fail, basically, the first time. And then building our support system. Now that is our support system currently in integrated pest management. We rely a lot on biological uh, control uh, on natural enemies. And so this is a cute little uh, 
uh, spotted uh, seven, seven spotted lady beetle larva. Uh, again, uh, another little friend uh, when I was trying to uh, you know work on sugarcane pest management in sorghum and Tifton. So I, I, I spent a lot of time just taking pictures of these little critters. <laughs> um, but, you know, as, as in, profession, in our profession, this is our support system. We need to build a support system in our lives as well, because we will be needing it. My biggest support system are my, my mentors. I am what I am, the confidence of, uh, that I have now, I wasn't always this way. When I arrived in 2010 as a PhD student, I had a lot of doubt about my abilities. Uh, but my PhD mentor, Dr. David Orr at NC State, my postdoc mentors, Dr. Dominic Reisig at NC State, uh, and uh, Dr. Michael Taves, all three of them molded me and gave me the confidence of, yes, you can do this. The, and the biggest thing is, they did. It, I was never reminded of the fact that I am a woman in STEM. That never came up. I was expected to compete hand in hand with men and perform well. And I think that was the biggest takeaway for me. So my PhD mentor, Dr. David Orr, he gave me the first uh, exposure of writing a grant proposal for the USD graduate student grant proposal. And I was... I, I was honored that he would think that I could do do it, and he helped me write. He he helped review, and he said it doesn't matter if you don't get it. I have funding for you. It, you tried, and that is more important. Well, I got the grant, which was even sweeter. But that was my first experience of being encouraged to do something, dream bigger, and try to achieve it. And then my postdoctoral mentor, Dr. Dominic Reisig. When he hired me, he said, Sriyanka, why don't you write a USDA CPPM grant with me as a co-PI? I'm like, are you kidding me? That's a big grant. And he said, yes, you can do it because you're a good scientist. And he gave me a lot of preliminary data and he said, start writing. And I wrote one and I, I kept doubting myself through the whole writing process. And he kept saying, this is a really good uh, uh, grant proposal. You can do it. And so we submitted it. And again, he kept telling me, don't worry if we don't get it. I have funding for you, but you need to try. Well, we got the funding uh, and I felt good that, okay, yes, another incident of how I can actually handle things that I didn't, I didn't think I would ever. And then Dr. Michael Taves. Dr. Taves helped me prepare for all the faculty interviews uh, and including this one. And so he literally helped me believe in myself and said, you will get a job. Remember, you will get a job, prepare well, show me your presentations. I will sit with you, I'll help you practice, but you will get a job. I told him, I need more help with writing papers. Please, can you go over with my papers? And he's a very busy man. He just became the Dean of the UGA Tifton campus, but he's one person who always has time for his students and his postdocs. It's like, no matter what, I'm going to sit down with you. I'm going to help you review your paper. So these little things along the way really helped shape my confidence in my abilities and help me dream bigger and get where I am and hopefully keep doing well. Supportive family. As I mentioned before, it's very important to have a very supportive family. I was very blessed that my family, uh, my husband, they're all very, uh, very supportive and I don't have the pressure of, well, my, me and my husband, we have been married for seven years, but we have never lived in the same city. And he's okay with that and we are okay with that and our parents are okay with that because they realize that the, our dreams are bigger than what we can uh, achieve as a family right now. So I think that, uh, I know a lot of my friends were kind of bogged down with that kind of a family pressure they were made feel guilty that they weren't doing their part as a woman. I am lucky that I haven't, I haven't felt that way. Uh, so that I think is very empowering as well. Uh, you, you, you can kind of balance both if, if you have a supportive family. And then friends. Now graduate school was very stressful as it is for everyone. And I had a group of uh, women in science. All these women are engineers. They work in big corporations. Uh, they work in the big, uh, uh, they're data scientists, 
they are power, uh, they work in power electronics. All of us had that same fear. Hey, are we going to fail in one year? What's going to happen to us in one year? So we used to always put aside like one, uh, maybe a spring break or something. Maybe two of us can drive. We barely rent a car. And we said, well, let's drive to Shenandoah. Let's just go. Let's just go. So I think those little exercises that we did and kind of just talked to each other, shared our mutual fears, that helped us to realize that I am not insulated or isolated in my experience. Other women are feeling the same way. And so you don't feel alone and you know whom to go to. And so I'm really thankful to through all my friends and we've all managed to keep in touch. We are all in different parts of the world, uh, but we try to keep in touch Facebook, WhatsApp, eh, use it for good. <laughs> and then, as I mentioned, I think the most important thing is a little encouragement goes a long way. Um, encouragement for my school, from my school uh, teachers. And if I look back, I remember that some of my favorite teachers in school were all women teachers somehow. I didn't, in, in, I didn't really plan it this way. It just, that's how I feel. Uh, my mentors, on the other hand, they, they have encouraged me so much. Um, and I think that really made a difference uh, in shaping my mind and uh, dreaming big, basically. So even a little bit of encouragement goes a long way. Now, as far as we're talking about encouragement, there's one point that I would want to make that I, I know made a lot of difference in my life was scholarships for women. Uh, in India, we have a lot of scholarships. Here's, here's a whole list. There's, it's longer. It just didn't fit here. And as I mentioned, single girl child is a, is a relative rarity in India right now because of the sexism. And then girl ch children pursuing post-graduation studies, that's even more rare. So there used to be a scholarship. It still exists. Uh, and I had applied for it and got it. Uh, and it said the Indira Gandhi Scholarship for Single Girl Child. Indira Gandhi was our first female prime minister. First female head of a nation, the largest democracy in the world. That in itself is very inspiring. Uh, that a country, a young country has already had a female head of the head of the state. She, she was unfortunately assassinated, but uh, there was a scholarship created in her name and it was for single girl children because she was a single girl child, if, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and the money is not that much. It's, it, it would probably be, be $500, $600 if, if I translate it into, uh, from, from INR. But that $500 meant the world to me when I started my master's program. So as I said, little things go a long way. Uh, when the society in some way tells you you're on the right path, keep doing what you're doing, you will be supported. You will find the right people and you'll be supported. America also has a lot of scholarship programs. I did a quick search and within a few minutes I found all these resources. I think as women in STEM fields, what we can do is we can encourage younger women to keep applying for these grants just apply for grants. They are not always a lot of money, but it makes you feel so good about your work and about your ambitions. Um, and then basically what has helped me and I think has helped a lot of my friends, as I said, they're all engineers, doctors, lawyers. They've all been through the same issues that I have been through. And what has helped us is we loved our work, first of all. That was the single most important thing. Love your work, have fun. Remember to have fun with your friends. Um, it always helps to show interest and initiative in your workplace that you come across as a very positive person and a very constructive person. And I think that would go a long way. Um, don't give up, please don't give up. Find your support system as I have 
my mentors, my colleagues. I have female colleagues in other universities who are also assistant professors in entomology just like me. We talk, we talk to each other because we, we have a lot of issues that we need sorting out and there's no one manual uh, or process, you know, processes to follow. You need to talk to each other. You know, talk to your family, have pets. Uh, it, it's important to reach out to other people. And most importantly, I'm really thankful to University of Florida for upping their game, hiring so many new women scientists, faculty members into their program. I'm very thankful to my lab because they share, I feel like they share the same ambitions that I do. And my program is only going to be as good as my lab. So I'm really thankful for them. And I always feel that I have been blessed with a lot of supportive mentorship. I want to pay it forward. And I think that that should be the general message, pay it forward. That is it, no more bug uh, uh, photos, sorry. <laughs> but yeah. Thank you. Jeez. Thank you, Dr. Lahiri, for that amazing presentation. Um, next up we have Dr. Mary Lusk. She's my advisor and I'm so lucky to have her as a mentor. Um, she is an associate, or an assistant professor, sorry, for the Soil and Water Sciences Department, and she runs the Urban Soil and Water Quality Lab here on campus. She has been here for two years as a professor, but, and she's also actually got her PhD here from 2011 to 2015. Her focus is on biogeochemical cycling of nitrogen, carbon, phosphorus, in urban landscapes and those impacts on water quality. So joining, join me in welcoming Dr. Mary Lass. All right, thanks everyone for being here today. I'm really excited to see so many of you here for our seminar. I really appreciate Dr. L Dr. Lahiri's words. Where did she go? <laughs> yeah. I really appreciate her comments. I was inspired listening to Dr. Lahiri and I, I was telling some people earlier today, I, you know, almost every week I give at least one extension talk across the state of Florida. I am always talking to professional audiences and it doesn't make me nervous at all in the least, but I am really nervous for today. <laughs> and I'm really nervous today for, for two reasons. First of all, sincerely, the amazing respect that I have for all of you, those of you that are students here, for, for Audrey and my students for putting this together. And because of that respect that I have for you, I want to do a really good job. So that makes me kind of nervous. And I also am nervous because I feel like I've been asked to give a talk on motherhood almost. You know, it's like there are millions of good mothers on this earth and they all do it differently. So I feel like how can I give a talk about being a woman in science when I want to acknowledge that we all are going to do it differently. And I think that's why I appreciate so much Dr. Lahiri's story and I've decided that the only thing I can do today is just tell you my story. And I do so acknowledging, acknowledging that it's my story, but I hope that in something that I say, there'll be something that will be of worth to you in my story. So um, I'm gonna begin my story in Rockingham, North Carolina. Rockingham, North Carolina is where I graduated from high school um, before most of you were probably born. Uh, Rockingham used to have a NASCAR motor speedway there. They called it the Rock. My first job in high school was as a radio announcer for WAYN Radio in Rockingham, North Carolina. We aired two things at WAYN, beach music, and if you are from the Carolinas, you know what I mean by beach music. And the second thing was NASCAR. And the president of the United States could be declaring nuclear war, but if there was a NASCAR event in town, we were covering the NASCAR because <laughs> that's what we did in Rockingham, North Carolina. So I went to college and began my college career as a freshman as a broadcast communications major. I wanted to be uh, a broadcast journalist and do news, newscasting professionally. So I went to college, started taking broadcast communications classes. A couple of days into my freshman year at college, my roommate dragged me to the university uh, planetarium and we got to use telescopes to look up, in, up into the night sky. What I saw that night was Saturn. I saw the real Saturn, not a picture of Saturn. I was really looking at Saturn. 
And it was the most amazing thing to me to think that I was looking at this object in the celestial world up there, you know. And I remember the first thought that I had after being amazed by that was I wanted to go home and call my dad and tell my dad, Dad, I saw Saturn tonight. I could see the rings. I could see the colors of it. And that to me is one of those first steps in my path toward becoming a woman in science. It's that realization, first of all, how excited I was by that. And secondly, how much I wanted to call my dad. I grew up in a home where we had bookcases full of books about everything, history and culture and languages and religions and science and nature. And I had parents that encouraged us to read those books and to learn from them. So that was kind of my first nudge towards my path. The second thing, and Dr. Lahiri, you're going to love this, had to do with an insect. So after my freshman year as a communications major, I came home from school. I came back to Rockingham, North Carolina for the summer. We always lived in the country. We always lived in a very rural area when I was growing up. Well, the whole place of Rockingham is pretty rural, so hard not to be rural. But I remember walking around in one of the fields around our house one day, the summer after my freshman year, and seeing a little grasshopper outside. I was just fascinated by watching this grasshopper. I honestly don't remember why I was fascinated by it, what it was doing, but I remember being very fascinated by it and thinking to myself, I really enjoy nature and I really enjoy sciencey kind of things. Why am I majoring in broadcast communications? And so I went back to school that fall and I changed my major to environmental science. So my bachelor's degree was from Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. And after I changed my major from communications, I ended up graduating with a bachelor's degree in agronomy and horticulture with an emphasis in environmental science. And um, the, first, the first semester that I was in that new major, there was a required course for everyone in that major. It was agronomy and horticulture 281, introduction to soil science. And I took that class and it was like the clouds parted and the sun began to shine, you know, and the birds were singing because it was like, oh my gosh, I love this. I really, really like soil science. So I continued in it, continued taking soil science classes and continued taking environmental science classes. And my last year there, um, I was taking an, uh, an undergraduate, uh, not an undergraduate, a graduate course uh, in uh, soil physics. Soil physics is the study of fluid transport in porous media, such as soils. So how water and contaminants move through soils and there were four people in the class, the first day of class. One dropped out a few days uh, into the semester, so the three of us left. Um, but I made it through that class, the hardest thing I've ever done. But I made it through and I got an A. And when at the end of the class, the professor came to me and said, hey, would you like a job in my lab? Uh, yes, of course. Um, and he offered me like $7 an hour, which was above minimum wage then. So, oh my gosh, it was amazing. And my previous part-time job prior to that was I worked um, cleaning toilets in an office building at night. So work in the soil physics lab, clean toilets at night, you know, no brainer. It was, it was amazing. I was so excited. And, and I really appreciate what um, Dr. Lahiri said about, you know, that there's people that give us opportunities in life. That to me was the first opportunity to work in science and I appreciated that so much. So I went to work for another year as an undergraduate in the soil physics lab there at Brigham Young University. I worked uh, with two master's students in that lab, uh, Sheldon Nelson and Clinton Williams. They were both getting their master's, de master's degrees. I was their little undergraduate helper. You know what they could have said to me, they could have said, Mary, go wash those dishes for me. Mary, go dump these soil samples for me. But they didn't. Let me tell you what they did instead and the power that it and an influence that it had on me. Instead, I want to talk about the, how they were important mentors to me. They would do things like um, take an extra five minutes out of their schedule and explain to me something about the science of what they were doing. They were both doing studies on contaminant fate and transport in soils, and they would talk to me about this contaminant and where it comes from and why we're studying it and why that's important. And when they took time to explain things to me, I was learning something new, and that was building me as a woman in science. They would also take a few extra minutes to just explain procedures to me. And you know, instead of just saying, well, I'm gonna run the GC mass spec today because I know what I'm doing, they took time to teach me. And by taking that time to teach me, I developed new skills and talents and increased my ability to be a woman in science. They involved me in their research. They involved me in planning. They took me out on field sampling events. They, it enabled me to sit down with them and talk about um, goals for, for writing up and presenting their research. 
And that gave me uh, confidence and belief in myself that I had skills to be a scientist. And that is so important. And that's why I titled this slide, The Power of Mentoring, both informal and formal. There's formal mentoring, where somebody's actually in a formal agreement with you and helping you through something and helping you learn something. That informal meeting, that mentoring there in the lab, where those were just two guys who were just taking time to help me and to teach me. Boy, that was powerful. And I appreciated that so much from them. That was going on 30 years ago. That was a long time ago. I still see the two of them every year at the Soil Science Society of America conference. And it is the highlight of my year to see them. I appreciate them so much. Never underestimate just those daily little things that you do to help and encourage the people in your labs, in your life. The power they had over my life was, was tremendous. So because of that, because of that experience working in the soil physics lab at BYU, I decided I'm going to go get a master's degree. So I traded the beautiful uh, mountains of Provo, Utah for the even more beautiful mountains of Southwest Virginia. I went to Virginia Tech and did a master's degree there in forest soils with Dr. Lucian Zelazny, who was absolutely a giant in the field. I almost did not do this. I almost did not do a master's degree because I was scared to death of it. I had watched those two guys that I worked for at BYU and I thought they were so smart and so perfect and I thought, I can never be that smart. I can never do that. I can never do what they do. For some reason, I plowed through that and I did it anyway. And I'm so grateful that I did. And here's my inspiring quote about that. And this is what I tell my students as well. Don't think of graduate degrees as certificates that say you know everything. Think of them as a license to ask questions. You know, I was scared to death of taking that next step in my professional education because I thought I had to know everything already. Never think you have to know everything already. Ask questions and learn and don't be afraid to learn and don't be afraid to just keep plowing through those challenges like uh, Dr. Lahiri said. So after that uh, master's degree, my next professional step, there were some years in between them, my next professional step was a PhD right here. I don't know how many of you know that, but I started right here, just like you guys. Um, I did my PhD here uh, from 2011 to 2015 with Dr. Gripal Tour, who is no longer with University of Florida uh, in the Soil and Water Sciences Department and focused on organic nitrogen, biogeochemistry, and urban landscapes. Now, let's go back here a couple of slides. So my master's was in 1998, PhD was in 2015. It did not take me 17 years to get a PhD. <laughs> Uh, those of you who can do, do uh, simple math here will notice there's a gap there, right? And this is where, this is my story, right? This is my story. Um, I, I, I love my story, but there is a gap there. What was I doing during those years? Let me tell you what I was doing during those years. These guys came along. Um, this is my husband, Craig. He's a mechanical engineering professor at uh, University of South Florida in Tampa. He's a mathematical genius. He got a national a career award from the National Science Foundation a couple years back and USF was so proud they put his picture on a postcard and uh, I'm still trying to bring his ego back to earth. <laughs> he, he is an awesome, he's an awesome <coughs> man. Um, when I was finishing my PhD and life was really stressful, he got our boys together. He said, boys, mom's really stressed out for the next little bit. She's working on her dissertation. We're going to learn how to cook and we're going to cook supper every night for this family and that and a hundred other things that he's done to support me and I love him for that. Our boys Joshua, Joshua's almost 18, he's Mr. Where's My Calculus Book. Alex is 15, um, he's Mr. Where's the Party. <laughs> Kyle is our oldest, he has grown and flown the nest. I'm very proud of him, he's currently living in Chipilo, Mexico where he's giving a hundred percent of two years of his life in missionary and humanitarian service to the people of Mexico. I didn't speak a word of Spanish when he left, but he's fluent now. So um, very, very proud of them. Um, they are my heart. They are absolutely my heart. But that's what I was doing in those years in between. All right. Um, so now I feel like I need to have some inspiring quotes for you. So my inspiring quote now about uh, life and how to be an awesome woman in science. Um, in keeping with my theme, here's my inspiring quote. You do you, <laughs> you do you. Do what is right, 
for you and only you know that. A um, couple stories here. A couple years ago, uh, th th this, is, this is related to women and um, you know, decision about working and families and th those kinds of things. This could apply to other situations. A couple years ago, uh, a female colleague came to me and said, you know, um, I, I, I feel like society is kind of telling me, um, you know, to, to go towards um, staying away from a, a career in science. Uh, some, of, some of that Dr. Leary talked a little bit about. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, she was looking at me saying, how, how do you do it? You know, I, said, I was like, well, you just, you just do it. Just ignore what people are telling you. You just do it. If you want to do it, do it. Um, that, that's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin, a couple years later, I also had another female colleague. I was telling her about my years as a, as a mother that I was home with my children. And she wears glasses and she had to take her glasses off and kind of wipe the tears out of her eyes. And she said, how come nobody told me I could do that? She just wanted to be a mom. And my message is, you do you. Do what is right for you and nobody knows what that is but you, it may be home with five kids. It may be working your way to become the research dean at a major university. It may be both of those. It may be neither of those. It may be some combination of all of it. Only you know what that is and follow what's in your heart, what you believe is right for you. And I really, really believe that that is really critical. My next inspiring quote is, and it's a caveat to this one, it's the 1.1 of this one, is that sometimes life is gonna throw you curveballs. Absolutely, I believe you've got to do what's right for you and follow your heart, but life rarely pitches straight. You know, things are going to come at you and it's going to be hard sometimes. Um, and I have a story about that at the end, about my own curveball in life. But here's some thoughts of that, um, of those two things. Just some of my thoughts on those two things right there. Um, you know, be your authentic best self and seek associations that will let you do that. So I have a good friend here in the Tampa area who is a medical doctor. She's a woman. Um, she tells the story of years ago when she was young, she was dating this guy and he proposed to her and they were going to get married, um, but he didn't want her to continue in medical school. And it broke her heart. But she's like, she finally said, you know what, if you're not going to be a step, this is a part of who I am. I don't think we need to be in a relationship. And she ended that relationship. Um, she's now married to a wonderful guy who does let her be who she is. And she, in return, lets him be who he is. Be your best self and seek associations that will allow that. And make sure you nurture those associations. Um, but accept that in your effort to always be this, there's going to be some curveballs in life. Some of those will just be annoyances. Some of them will downright overwhelm you. Some of them will bring you to your knees. Some of them will just whack you upside the head. And when those come, hopefully at that point, you have already decided what's important to you and already decided who you are and what your priorities are in life. If you haven't had those moments, those curveball moments in life yet, think now, how are you going to act when they come? So that you've already made a decision. It makes it a little bit easier. So decide what's going to be your priority and how you're going to move forward. Sometimes it does mean just moving forward, plowing forward, but sometimes it's going to mean plan B or plan C or plan D or plan all the way out there because sometimes that's just what life is. My two cents, there are some things that are worth sacrificing for. Don't sacrifice your health, your mental health, your physical health. Don't sacrifice your families and the well-beings of your homes. Don't sacrifice your integrity, but do the best that you can as long as you, whenever you have a choice, First and foremost, be true to who you are. Another thing that's really important, I think, is to discover and develop your talents. What inspires you? What makes you say, wow, this is cool? What do you really enjoy doing? Think about those things. Ask your friends and your families and your mentors what they think your talents are. Ask them to help you develop those talents. Take time every day to develop those things. Learn new skills. I love what Dr. Lahiri said about wanting to learn grant writing. Identify skills that you would need to have in your professional career, in your personal life, and take time to work on those every day, even if it is at a slow, comfortable pace, even if it's just 10 minutes a day. Take that time to do that. Set boundaries for your work-life balance. Whatever that is for you, again, this is my story, so you decide what your boundaries are going to be, but ask yourself questions like, when will you respond to emails? 
Will you respond on weekends, on Friday night, on Sunday morning? Or will you wait until Monday morning to do that? Um, I, I, I realized when I put this up here, I have never expressly said this to my students and members of my lab, so I'm going to say it now. If I ever email you at like 10 o'clock on a Friday night or 8 a.m. on a Sunday morning, that's because that's when it was convenient for me to send that email. You do not have to respond to me on a Sunday morning or a Friday night. Um, that, that's my boundary. You know, the flip of that is don't expect me to respond <laughs> on a Sunday morning or, or whatever it is. You know, have those boundaries in your mind and stick to them. Now, you know, decide what hours you're going to be available and when you're going to work, um, how often you're going to work late or come in early. And <laughs> I put this up here, too many priorities equals no priorities. What do I mean by that? Too many priorities equals no priorities. Don't overcommit. Don't overcommit. Boy, I have learned that lesson the hard way. I have learned it by being beat upside the head with the negative consequences of it. Um, don't overcommit, exactly. You know, decide where your boundaries are, decide, keep your focus. This is where I can do things. This is where I just cannot right now. And don't be afraid of that big word in a saying, no, I can't do that. And I have learned, I, I have learned not to say, gosh, you know, that sounds really great. I'm busy this week, but how about next week? I, I don't even go there anymore. I just say, you know what, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't have time for that. And it's just not on my list of things right now that I can make a priority. Be okay with that. Learn to say that. Okay. Um, all right. Personal story about mental health. One of the things that Audrey and Deb asked, asked us to potentially speak on was how um, our mental health has been affected by uh, working as a woman in science. And I, this, this, this was my curveball story. Um, so I'm going to tell you this story begins Christmas Day, 2015. So Christmas Day, 2015, I got on a plane from Tampa. I flew up to Greensboro, North Carolina, where my parents were living at the time. Um, I got a car, went to their apartment, knocked on the door. Uh, my parents answered the door. And I'm sorry, this, this is going to sound kind of bad. This, I'm, I'm going to tell you all the truth of it. So they opened the door and smell overwhelmed me. But that smell is why I was there. My mother was in the advanced stages of Alzheimer's disease. My father had been caring for her. My elderly father had been caring for her completely by himself for years, and he was no longer able to do so. The house was a mess. She was a mess. Everything was a mess. I was there to move them to Florida to be with me. So I'm there for three days. I'm packing up everything in their house so we can move it to Florida. My husband was going to come with a U-Haul and drive us back down to Florida for a while. Three days were there. My husband calls me. He says, sweet. My brother Paul just passed away. Oh my gosh, sweetie, I'm so sorry. Okay, you go be with your mom. <laughs> I'll take care of things here. So I'm there with two elderly people. We're packing up the entire house, their entire lives, their 50 years of marriage. We're packing it up. I pack them up. I get in the car. We start driving to Florida from North Carolina. It's like a 14 hour drive. My mom is completely out of her mind. She has no understanding of what's taking place. She cannot feed herself. She cannot go to the bathroom by herself. She cannot dress herself. She doesn't know who she is. She doesn't know what her name is, where she lives, or how to be safe. She doesn't know not to walk in traffic. So we're in a hotel that first night after we drove a couple hours. She doesn't know to not get up in the middle of the night and walk out of the hotel and start walking around in traffic. So I stayed up all night, keeping her safe in the hotel room, got no sleep, and had like a 10 hour drive the next morning to, the, to Florida with the two of them <laughs> and all of their stuff behind us. Got here in my life, that's what my life became for the next two years, was taking care of her. She needed 24-7 care. So in the midst of her 24-7 care that she needed, I had the beginnings of this job. I had three kids. I was losing my mind. This year, or this week, actually Thursday this week, will make three years since she passed away. Three years is a long time. Three years is a very long time, but I still pay the emotional price of those years when I was caring for her and trying to do this job and take care of three children to the best of my abilities. Now, I don't know the answer to that. I wish that I did know some magic words to say to you, but why I'm telling this story is that I really hope that in this country we will have more conversations about support for families, both women and men, 
who find themselves in those situations. Let me give you some statistics. 17% of Americans, or 39.8 million people, are currently caregivers for an adult with an illness or a disability. That's almost one in five. So count up every fifth one of you in this room, chances are you're gonna be a caregiver at some point. 67% of those are women. So when I said count off one in five, if you're a woman, maybe count off one in four or one in three. If you're a Latina or a black woman, that 67% becomes like 70 something percent. Okay. Of, here's some more statistics about women being caregivers in the workforce and also having full-time jobs. Of women who are caregivers, look at these statistics. 33% decreased their work hours so they could be caregivers. 29% passed up a job promotion, training, or an assignment. 22% took a leave of absence. 20% switched from full-time to part-time. 16% just quit. And 13% retired early. Those are things that will greatly affect your goals, your professional development. Talk about curveballs in life. These are curveballs, right? So you gotta decide when that time comes, whatever your curveball is, which of these are bottom, none of the above, is gonna be your response. I don't know. Only you will be able to decide that. But I hope that you will make a decision that will take care of you, that will take care of those around you, that'll be right for you and your circumstances. I hope, like Dr. Lahiri said, that you will have an awesome support system because that is so important. I could not have made it through those two years that I did with my mother had not been for my husband and then supported my children. I remember calling my boys in one night when I was particularly overwhelmed. I was in tears. You know, on the floor in tears, feeling so overwhelmed with life. And I said, boys, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry because I feel like I'm failing you. And my oldest just said, mom, you're doing great. Mom, you're great. So I hope that you will have that support system too. And I hope also that you will be that support system to yourself. I, I'm going to finish with this picture. I took this picture from the UN site celebrating today. It's February 11th, it's International Day of Women and Girls in Science. I love this picture. Isn't this a beautiful picture? Look at these beautiful young girls. This one right here, you can kind of see she's got some glass test tubes, it looks like. She's looking at something in a test tube. That's exactly the experience I had when I took that first job in the soil physics lab as an undergraduate at BYU. I would mix up little chemicals in test tubes, and I would just think it was so cool to be able to use my ability to see and my ability to think to to analyze and observe what was going on in those test tubes. And I really believe in the power that all people have, women and men, to do good in our own lives, in our families, in our communities, in our nations, when we have education. So whatever that education is, whether it be in history or politics or cultures or religions or science, there is a power to do good. And I just love this picture because it just screams that power that women and girls have to contribute to our society and contribute to good in the world. So I just really hope that we will all take advantage of the opportunity to be mentors, to be supportive, to be kind to one another, to support each other, and remember that everybody's story is everybody's story. And that's my story. It's all I have to offer you today. I hope that something in it has helped some of you somehow. Um, I would love to hear other stories. I think right now, Audrey and Deb are gonna open it up for questions. So. Um, this is the end of my presentation, so I will end there. Thank you so much, Mary. I think I almost started crying. <laughs> um, so we do have a panel discussion. I know we're eating into lunchtime, so we're going to allocate like 15 minutes for a panel discussion. And before we get started, I just wanted to share this quote with you that meant a lot to me when I was an undergraduate, and it still means a lot to me today. And it's by Africa's first woman president, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. And that is, if your dreams don't scare you, they aren't big enough. So it's okay to feel scared. Um, so now I'd like to invite Mary and Trianka to come sit up here for the panel discussion. And if you're on Zoom, uh, feel free to type in the chat box and we'll be checking that. Thank you. 
So yeah, questions. Who's got a question? friends who work either in industry but um, or in academia, but we all work in agriculture. And whether um, biases, with gender biases are you know, real or perceived, I still think they're important. And a few of my friends, when they tried to bring something up um, to their colleagues or coworkers, have been accused of playing the gender card. And I was wondering how you, how, how do you deal with a situation like that? <laughs> well, that's a that's a very good question. It's a tough one. Okay, so the question is, um, how do you how are you not perceived as um, un I don't know how to <laughs> um, bring up the gender card, but um, you're perceived as it's not justified to bring it up at that point? Don't mind that. <laughs> <laughs> no. I have never been in that situation. I, I, I know, that's why I know. I'm, I'm sorry to have the past book here. I, guess <laughs> I, don't, I don't have any personal experiences there. Um, if there is an evidence of um, a qualified applicant being uh, not being selected. Um, there may be a case there, but I, I don't know enough about this incident. Can you tell us more? Um, well, then it's general thing. So even like workplace safety, for example, like most workplace safety um, research has been done with men, and we know that women's skin is better than men. And so is there a difference between what kind of protection women's skin needs versus you know, it could be anything like that. But it's, to me, it's more of, they're shutting down the conversation immediately by telling you your claim isn't valid. And whether it is or not, there should still be a discussion because perception is reality. You know, like, that, that's what we perceive or that's what my friend perceived was happening. And to just be told, like, hush, little girl, basically. You know, I don't, but, in, but of course, we come up with all these great things to say after. You know, I'm very witty a day or two later. <laughs> so in the shower, yeah. Right, right. But I don't know how to handle it in that moment. Or maybe it's okay once I've had a day or two or them to come back. And is it okay to reapproach the, the topic later? I mean, it always is. Yes. And and it kind of, so, yeah, talking, getting talking down to that, I think, kind of uh, addresses the same issue. There is a lot of that still. And it's unfortunate that it happened to your colleague. It exists, but I would suggest we be persistent. Uh, and there is no point in uh, going to the same resource repeatedly. Uh, if you have experienced something like that, change is coming, but change is slow as well. Mm -hmm. So it's important to diversify uh, your approach routes, basically. Look for several opportunities. Not all of them are terrible people, you know? So don't put all your eggs in the same basket. Yeah, I absolutely echo all of that. I would also say, you know, it's absolutely inappropriate to approach a person and just say, you know, hey, you handed this way or you said these things, that made me kind of, that made me feel this way. And, um, let me just tell you what's going on in my mind. Let me explain to you what I mean. You know, I don't have any experiences directly related to that. The closest I have is a, a, a senior colleague uh, who stole some of my work one time and didn't give me credit for it. And I'm very proud to say that I just went to him and said, I did this, and this is not acceptable, and um, please don't do this again. It was a hard conversation to have because I'm not in confrontation with person, but I did it, and I was like, <laughs> and you know what? Um, boy, let me just tell you, I mean, I see him um, every now and then uh, still, and he just kind of, you know, I, he got it, he got the message. Um, it's, it's absolutely okay to have those conversations. Any other questions? Let's see if we can talk about more 
What is your favorite experience so far of the Kendo Science World? Wow. Um, well, it's like I asked me what I mentioned my children, but I love the best. Um, <laughs> I I really love really working with Um I don't know if I showed that to you guys. I'm finding I'm just tired and worn out all the time. But I do really enjoy working with students. And that's you know I, I didn't talk about this much, but I started out at University of Florida um, for two years in a 100 percent extension position and then transferred into this position as an assistant professor. And I did so because I wanted that student interaction. To me, um, being involved with, with, with Young people who are they just just learning. I man, that's that's the reward. All right. So in my case, I think uh, what was really special to me was when I got my first request on research gate from a graduate student uh, overseas asking for a copy of my publication. <laughs> That was the first since then I have received many requests uh, from students who want more clarification or who just want to uh, um, uh, get some guidance uh, on their work. I think that's the highlight of uh, my work so far. That, that's what inspires me every day, frankly speaking. Um, the, and even at a uh, when I was a graduate student and I was presenting my first poster as a PhD student, uh, another graduate student who was just starting her program came up to me and said, um, "I really want to work with this insect that you're working on, uh, and I can't seem to be able to uh, find them in the field. And here you are, you've done this experiment. Can you please?" Tell me more about the design of your cages. How do you do it? And I was a graduate student at that time, and I just felt amazing that here we are collaborating. She was also she she was a female graduate student from another university. So that that told me that my work is valuable. It's useful to other people. And now I get the evidence that the, my work from my PhD program is now being utilized in international locations. So I think that is my uh, the most special thing to me. Yeah, I thought of another one. Um, she got to mention collaboration. The other thing I really enjoy and it's exciting to me is being part of collaboration. I, I love that. I love not only the camaraderie of working with other people, but also that feeling of there's this group of people, and here's my little part where I can contribute. Like recognizing that I have a part where I can, I have skills that nobody else in the group has, and this is where I contribute. So this person over here is contributing their skills, and this person over here is contributing their skills. Boy, here I am, and I do have things that I can contribute. I don't have to know everything. I contribute what I can. That's <coughs> So as a man, I got to try to, you know, encourage people, uh, encourage women in like the STEM fields and like undergrad and even my close friends at the to like pursue their dreams and stuff. But there are certain times where they still feel like a lack of motivation and stuff like that. Um, so how can I, like, what can I do or say? I wish they had been here for you guys to talk because that was truly awe inspiring. Like you guys both did an amazing job. Um, but what can I do or say, like, as a man, to be able to like give them that motivation again, or just help them see that, like, you know, they can do. You know, so the question was how how can, can men um, inspire women in, in science or in their dreams or whatever? Rather coincidentally, um, receiving the mail today by BYU alumni magazine it was perfect for a little bit earlier. And uh, there's an article in there by a researcher who's looked at that very thing. Some timeline, I should have brought with you today. But um, there's research that's showing that um, for women, uh, they need, uh, it said, um, on average, three nudges was the, uh, was the word that the researcher used 
if they need to be nudged on average three times, by nudges they mean for that person that says, hey, I believe in you, or that person who says, no, I feel like you have a talent or whatever, or hey, you know, we'll make you feel that way. And so I would say, you know, just keep giving the person who's providing those nudges. You know, you have a different thing. You have a talent for you. you know? And I know that was a nudge in my life, was, was just my husband who, and when I was making a decision um, after our youngest child went back to the of the first grade, I was making a decision about coming back to school or not. He said, so you have too much to offer to not be given into the world. And that was a nudge. So be the person who provides that. Yeah, I completely agree uh, that, um, first of all, shout out to all the men here and on Zoom who have found time uh, in the busy schedule to attend. Uh, this get together, uh, this meeting of minds, and yes, I think that has been a very crucial part in my life as well as uh, encouragement and encouragement from, from all the members in my family my husband, my father, my father in law, my, my male colleagues. And yes, there are several times when you feel that this is, it's, this is not achievable, I can't do this, I have to sacrifice so much in my personal life to uh, get here, is it worth it? So it's basically at that time when uh, someone comes up to you and tells you, no, this is worth it. You have so much to offer to the world and don't be afraid of failure. And, you know, as I mentioned, like little scholarships, tell them, hey, listen, there are these little scholarships. Why don't you apply and see if you can get some, uh, uh, some little nudge uh, that goes a long way. It's not about the money. It's it's about acknowledgement from society. And I totally agree. I, that's an amazing statistic. I never thought about that. Three nudges. I, I need to think back in time and maybe I received three nudges as well. But yes, just yeah. If you are aware of resources that they can benefit from, share them, share that with them and you say, hey, let's try at least class. So that was a great question, then. Thank you both for such great presentation. Um, I want to know, uh, in, in your position as leaders in each of your labs and your programs, how do you keep the equilibrium to encourage girls and encourage women in science um, together with being fair with others, uh, with girls and, and with, with women and men in your lab? Uh, how, because I, I feel that there's a fine line between, you know, being encouraging people, but also being unfair sometimes. How, how do you manage that or how do you make the right decisions? I don't think there are like rules, but um, what has been your experience in that? Thank you. Maybe I don't think I don't do a good job that maybe I need to ask myself that question. Um, there, there was this uh, article of Mary and I were just when, when we were finding this, and I was, uh, uh, I was mentioning that apparently when you, when you look at issues that women face, uh, specifically in STEM fields, there, there is this article that says, the worst critics of women are other successful women. Um, I was very shocked by that, though. Uh, but apparently, it, it, so it, it says that women who are in a certain position of power are uh, more likely to be less empathetic to your situation because they feel that they, they have been through that and they have achieved their goals. Why can't you? Um, I have mixed feelings about that. I am, uh, I'm just getting started and I hope to God that I don't become this person who is not empathetic to my students needs. Um, I think what, I think what I try to do and what I have benefited is benefited from as a woman in science, being treated equally. I've never been reminded that, oh, there's field work. And there's this that only women will do and men will do. No, I've always been in a situation where my mentors expected just as much from me as they did 
um, my male colleagues. So basically, I have never been reminded of the fact that I, I am a woman in the sin. And I, and I think that is the most empowering thing. Um, and um, that's what the world, uh, the way that things are set right now, we're expected to accomplish just as much as men are expected to. And yes, there's an unfairness. I feel like we, we feel like we're women fear failure because we don't get enough chances. So we feel that we need to accomplish even more sometimes. Um, I don't know how true that is, but uh, I think the best thing that we as women in position of power can do is treat everyone equally. That is the just world. You have to walk hand in hand with men. So. Train yourself accordingly. And that's the message that I have. We have time for one more question. Okay. All right. So just to wrap this up, I want to thank our speakers again. So go ahead and join me in thanking them for. Also, um, on behalf of Audrey and myself, we want to thank the Gulf Coast Postdoc and Student Association. So they actually um, co-hosted this event. This is the local student group on campus. And Chloe here has two certificates of appreciation for our speakers. So thank you so much. And then, of course, thank you to the Gulf Coast REC for supporting efforts like this. Um, we had full support from Jack and all the other folks at the center when we said we wanted to do this. So we definitely feel honored to work at a place that is so supportive of all the researchers and people who live here.